Welcome back guys. Mr. Midnight is still not here. We're going to be looking at two long haul trucker stories. One is a bus story and one is a truck story. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope these stories make you think twice before you go on a road trip. And always remember the darkness always follows. Aside from the fact that it was a company policy, I made it a point to never ever pick up a hitchhiker. I've seen too many horror thriller slasher movies, even have the desire. Even if the line in the movie Detroit Rock City reminds me you that a lot of also start out like that. Not to mention I still have flashes of the Rutger horror movie, The Hitcher from my childhood, to remind me that it's just not a good idea. Under other circumstances, I have no compunction or hesitation about being a good Samaritan. Most of the time I ask my subjects if they want to use their real names when telling the stories. If they don't, I give them the opportunity to pick the name I'll use. If they don't pick a name, as you've seen, I'll pick a name that has something to do with their musical tastes. Such was the case with Lemmy. He wasn't your average motorhead fan. Seeing he as he just turned 85 this year, he may be old, but I'll bet he can drive circles around you and parallel park a fully loaded rig better than you can a Mini Cooper. Lemmy doesn't hit the road with a rig anymore, but he does drive trailers around a warehouse near his home for a living. He says he doesn't need to, but he told me it's when you stop moving that everything sizes up, everything seizes up, and that's when the Reaper gets your ass. I agree Lemmy, I agree. I was driving for a logging company from the late 1950s until the early 1980s, anywhere from Oregon and Washington to Maine and Georgia and even Alaska for a few seasons. I've seen some crazy shiz, from logging accidents that would make even the most cast iron stomach some be chuck his lunch to Rex on the logging roads that neither Stephen Hawking nor Stephen King could explain even if they put their melons together. Well, it was only a week or two after May 18, 1980. If you all were alive back then, that's when Mount St. Helens erupted, blowing a huge chunk of the mountain sideways. I imagine you can find a video of it these days on that YouTube's or whatever it's called. Anyone who lived within a few hundred miles will recall how the ash fell like snow and covered every goddamn thing. We ended up covering our exhaust and intakes with old t-shirts to keep the ash from effing up our engines. It took a short while for the state of Washington to clear the boards from the deep ash fall. At the time I was driving a logger rig down the mountains in that area, or if I were lucky, I'd get to drive the rigs from the bottom of the logging camp to the mills we contacted for. There was speculation in the campus that the logging business in the area was going to grind to a halt. But then we heard that our company had won a contract bid to clear a good portion of the blowdown trees, that the eruption had destroyed in the vicinity of the mountain and that we're now clogging up Spirit Lake at its base, so that eased our fears of impending layoffs in the meantime. I was driving along US-20 from the base camp to one of the mills outside Tacoma when I came across a figure shrouded in a parking against the rain. They were trudging through five inches of mud on the roadside that the ash fall had turned into. I felt a bit bad for them and since we were so close on the heels of the eruption, I still had the spirit of charity in my heart. I stopped to offer them a ride. Where are you headed, partner? I shouted it because the rain was deafening on the roof of my truck. He looked up at me and I recalled a bit because this fellow looked like he'd been left in the oven a bit too long. He smiled and pulled the cardboard sign out of his park. Portland or bust, it read. I'm headed to just outside Tacoma so I can get you that far at least. The guy shot me a thumbs up and stored his sign. Climbing up into my passenger seat, being careful not to shake the rain off his parka onto my relatively dry interior. He lowered his hood and by God, he was an ugly son bit. Every bit of skim I could see looked like he'd been charboiled. He even smelled a bit sulfurous and burnt. 
For Frick's sake, man, what the hell happened to you? He held up a finger, as if to say one second, and dug around in his pockets. Producing a stubby pencil and a small notebook, he scribbled. Don't know, woke up like this, sorry, can't talk. I looked at him a little bit. What do you mean you woke up like that? He bent to his tablet again. Woke up in the woods by the mountain, he pointed off in the direction of Mount St. Helens. You get right the F on out of here. You got caught in the eruption. How in the name of Satan's gnarly nooksack are you alive? He shrugged and laughed a little. It sounded like a pair of pumice stones rubbing together in a sandpaper bag. Did you just get out of the hospital or something? He frowned a little and shook his head. Well, cut my nuts and call me Susan. Actually, name's Lemmy. What do you go by, son? The guy kind of hung his head and shook it, writing, Don't know. I don't remember anything except I need to go to Portland. Now, I'm a fairly sceptical person, and I do tend to call people out when they're feeding me a line of bullshit. But this guy looked like he didn't have a bone of de deceit in him. Well, if that doesn't rattle the bishop's tits, I don't know what I'd do if I didn't remember my name. I take that back. I've been that drunk before. The sound of more rocks tumbling together told me he was laughing. She's alcoholic, quiz, quiz man, though. You're ugly enough to pull it off. This ain't got the hump. He considered it and showed, giving me a thumbs up. I didn't know what else to say at that moment, so I clapped my trap and drove for a little bit before a question occurred to me. What do you think you are doing in that area, and what do you think is waiting for you in Portland? He looked like he was thinking real hard. He wrote, I woke up just on the far side of the lake that the mountain sits on. He was shrugging for the name I helped. Spirit Lake? You're kidding. You were that close, he nodded. That's where I woke up anyway, said the pad. We rode a long time. As far as Tacoma, I have no idea. Home, work, family. I'm hoping it's at least one of these things. I agreed that that would bode well for his situation. He gave me a sheepish look. Then and wrote, I haven't eaten anything substantial since I woke up. Do you mind if you stop somewhere to eat? I must have looked at him funny because his eyes got a worried look and he quickly scribbled. I have money. I said it was no problem and we stopped off at the next exit that had a fast food joint. As we took off after the food stop, he seemed to doze off a bit, leaning against the passenger door. That was alright with me and I just hammered down as much as the road conditions would let me. I heard a growling noise all of a sudden. My eyes shot over to Quasimodo, and he was out like a light. The sound was deep and grating. Imagine what the tectonic plates on a fault line might sound like a thousand feet down if you could get a mic down there without it melting. Then he started saying something in his sleep. At least I think he was talking. Though it didn't sound like any language I knew. It sounded like a mix uh, uh, of German, Hungarian and someone rubbing two big rocks together. I didn't like it at all, especially when a bit of smoke or steam, whatever it was, drifted from between his lips. Hey, Cosimado, wake up! He jerked awake just with the start, his eyes meeting mine with a trace of concern as he scrambled for his notebook. What's wrong, he wrote in all capitals. I don't know if you were snoring or talking in sleep, but you just had some bizarre ass sound coming out of your face hole. I thought you couldn't speak. He looked puzzled and wrote, I can't, well, at least not without sounding like I drank acid or something. He opened his mouth and a noise like a broken conveyor belt issued from his throat. I held up my hand. Gotcha, gotcha. Just don't do that again. He gave me a thumbs up as we pulled in Tacoma. He slipped a thank you note wrapped into a $20 bill into the visor above his head. I tried to tell him it wasn't necessary and reached out to grab his shoulder as he turned to get out of the truck. The second I touched him, there was a sizzling sound, and I drew my hand back and watched as a red welt rolled on my palm. I looked at Quasimodo again, saw steam rise off his shoulders as the rain hit him. His eyes almost looked like they were luminescent red, just in the white store. He smiled and chuckled. That sound like breaking rocks again and waved goodbye as he turned and walked away through the truck stop parking area. This was the last time as a long runner and it was the last time I ever picked up a hitchhiker. You can bet your sweat ass on that. There's always been a quiet debate amongst drivers whether they are long-haul truckers, 
traveling salesmen, charter bus drivers and the like, or just people who travel a lot. As to what region of this country has the weirdest shiz happen on their roads, or just off them in some cases, by the occurrence, super or extra natural, in origin, ghost, phantasms, serial killers, wendigos, or just plain run-of-the-mill psychopathic sociopathic douche caneos that have nothing better to do with their lives other than F with other people. Sadly, the latter is far too prevalent. But I digress. You came here for a story, not a soliloquy. Feel free, however, to catch up at the bottom. I will apologize in advance as this is not a trucker story, but a story told to me by a friend who drove a bus route for over 15 years. I hope you enjoy. Marcus just retired at the ripe young age of 46 from a certain company whose slogan might have asked its pop-up patrons to leave the driving to us. With a distinguished 28 years, he started as a ticket clerk and eventually got his Class B license and became a driver. He retired as a regional administrator for the southeastern US. It's in this area the story takes place. I was doing my a loop route at the time from New Orleans to Atlanta, Atlanta to Nashville and Me Mepsis. Then Mepsis back down to New Orleans, stopping at all points in between. Now, you may know that New Orleans has a culture steeped in the occult and is a large service industry and tourism town to boot. So when I say I get all kinds on my bus, you better believe it. On this particular run, I had everything from nuns, students and soldiers to party, burnouts, retirees and people transitioning to new places for new lives. I was raised a good Catholic boy, so I made sure that sisters had good seats for certain. I apologise for my professional treatment, but growing up in an orphanage, these women were basically my mums. And who doesn't treat their mama right? Marcus is indeed a very religious man and doesn't swear. He endearingly refers to them by their first initials and won't even cl come close to uttering a god damn it, which is scrollage for him, so I'll be supplying the colour translation to his commentary of the events that took place. So I have the sisters up front along with a young lady they tell me is travelling with them to the Mercy Convent just outside Savannah, Georgia, where she is to begin training changing buses in Atlanta. When I asked the young lady if she was excited to serve the Lord, she shied away and I got a stern admonishment from the highest ranking sister there. Sir Vanessa has taken a vow of silence until her ceremony of commitment. Please refrain from speaking to her as she may be tempted to break that vow. Vanessa hung her head a bit and I felt immediately guilty, but that's all a part of being Catholic. I thanked the sister for her guidance and suggested they settle in since it was a 14-hour trip from New Orleans to Atlanta. There were several stops in town and on the outskirts of town before we hit the open road, so everyone was still talkative and lively around 10pm when we crossed over to Mississippi on I-55 northbound. You folks might not know why riding on a bus cross-country is so affordable, so I'll briefly explain. Most bus services hit just about any little old town that's not too terribly far off any given route, thus turning what by car might be a 4-5 hour drive into a 14-20 hour odyssey by bus, mainly because instead of travelling directly on the major highways, many routes follow parallel to them of rural routes and country roads depending. I've done it several times myself and it's a great way to meet interesting people for sure. Sorry again for interrupting. We're about halfway to Jackson when the disturbances began. People were complaining of a faint smell of rotten eggs or of flies on the bus. I could only assure show them that this bus, according to the maintenance logs, which I willingly displayed for them along stops, was cleaned two hours prior to their coming on board. I'm bit of a stickler for cleanliness and made sure my bus was one of it and if not the cleanest in the fleet, one of our internal mottos is take pride in your ride and I most certainly did. There was a bit of a drive after our last pickup and our first major stop in Jackson so people had time to settle in and fall asleep, including the sisters escorting young Vanessa. 
She was humming a tune I wasn't familiar with and gently rocking back and forth. I could see this is in a small parabolic mirror I have on the dash to give a view of the passenger cabin so I could keep an eye out for anyone pulling shenanigans. The distortion of the curved surface of the mirror made her eyes look bigger than they were and her head mishappen. It was an unnerving effect. I was about to pick up the mic to quietly announce our immediate arrival into the city of Jalgerson when something in my mirror caught my eye and gave me a pause. Vanessa had turned around in her seat and was staring at something towards the back of the bus. I couldn't turn my head that far to look and still keep my eyes safely on the road at the same time. So I kept a watchful eye in snippets. She seemed to be pointing at someone and then beckoning them to her. But as far as I could tell in the darkened bus, everyone back there was asleep. I politely turned my head and said, Miss, please turn around and be seated. We'll be entering the city shortly. I think I saw her make a face at the me in the mirror, but I'm not sure. I took the mic and announced five minutes until Jackson arrival. In Jackson, the couple sitting behind the nuns and Vanessa approached me as I was assisting a porter with the loading and unloading of baggage. Sir, could you maybe make an announcement to the bus before we leave in regards to trash and food or something? Someone in our area has a rotten ham salad sandwich or something and it's making my wife nauseous. It'll be greatly appreciated. I told them I'd make an announcement of sorts and in the meantime, if they wanted to rebound the bus, at this time, there may be open seats in a section away from the source of the smell. I went to the terminal manager and asked if he could have someone from sanitation personnel take a walk through the bus to ascertain the source. With no passengers on the bus, it was an easy sweep that came up negative. There were no foul orders. If anything, the sanitation clerk complained that the New Orleans crew had used a fresh scent spray a bit too liberally. I announced boarding and the couple were the first on the bus, making a beeline for the rear of the bus. It was about 2 a.m. when we finally departed the terminal and people were beat and tired. The bus fell almost immediately to silence, with the exception of the elder sister who snored like a lumberyard. Nobody stirred except for Vanessa. Call it the vibrance of youth or nervous energy over starting a new life. She was wide awake. Looking around the cabin, I knew from when I came back on board and the safety lights were still on that there were no passages in the last two rows but she kept staring back there. She would occasionally giggle and resumed humming. At one point I heard a low murmur too deep to be reset Nessa was coming from her vicinity. The noise ceased at once as one of the nuns stirred and asked Vanessa if she needed to use the restroom. They made their way back and as far as I can tell the nun went in with her. This was odd to me but I'm not a hundred percent on how they operate. They were in there for a good 3-5 minutes. As far as I can reckon, I have to keep my eyes on the road if I want to keep my safe driver for honest. So admittedly, time got away from me when the door opened. I could barely tell what was going on back there, but it appeared that the nun pointed to the fall from the bus and Vanessa returned to her seat next to the sleeping elder. She looked like she was finally settling in. The nun that went into the bathroom did not come back up from but seemed to have disappeared into the one of the two empty rear rows. Nobody voluntarily sits next to the bathroom unless they want privacy or hope to no good, but this was a nun, so I opted to believe in the former. I noticed that Vanessa had lain her head down on the shoulder of the elder nun and appeared to be fast asleep. I caught a whiff of a rotten eggs-like smell, and that murmuring from before started again. This time, I still couldn't make out words, but it sounded like a chant of sorts, deep and foreboding. I remember seeing a sign reading, Granada, one mile. We didn't have a stop here, but it's where I pick up RR8 to head over towards Dupelo, Dupelo, birthplace of Elvis Aaron Presley, the king himself. Marcus cleared his throat and sat up a bit straighter in his seat. When we hit the town limit of Granada, all hell, both literally and figuratively, broke loose. With a jolt, the elder nun sat up with the most ungodly scream, like her insides had been lit afire. She started tearing at her clothes and saying things no woman, let alone a nun, should utter. Dear God, forgive <coughs> the W. I've lain with men, I've tasted the flesh of sea and sea alike, I played with my end during mass, I licked Sister Marie's 
on a dare when I was 23. I don't think I'm going to read this. I stole my parents from my parents and burned their shed to the ground. Dear God, please forgive this filthy. I thought I was going to wreck the bus. Here's this nun, a woman of God, tearing off her clothes and exposing herself and confessing her every sin to the world. I was terrified. Next thing I knew, she lurched forwards, grabbed the door lever and wrenched it open with inhuman strength. She threw herself from the bus in a sworn dive at 55 miles per hour. I swerved to the left as I didn't want to run the poem and under the tyres and stood on the brakes. I sat there for a moment, my hands shaking in their death grip on the wheel. I looked out into the darkness. I, the confused, muttering of the other passengers and, and laughing. I looked for the source of the laughter. I found it in the maniacally grinning face of Vanessa. I'm ashamed to say I was not the first person out of the bus to check on the nun. One of the young soldiers aboard was a combat medic. He rushed to assess the damage. I didn't manage to get on my radio and contact the authorities in a bus. I stepped out of the bus and approached the still naked form of the elder nun. The soldier had rolled her over to perform first aid, but we could tell it was too late for her. She had landed in such a way that the vast majority of her face and breast had been scrapped away by her impact with the road surface. Her palms and forearms were free of abrasion. She hadn't even attempted to stop her dive towards death. The police took statements and took photos. When I explained that the nun had been sitting next to the young girl, the police were unable to find her. Vanessa had slipped away in the confusion. We found the other nun in the rear of the bus, huddled in the darkness, her eyes and tongue missing. An autopsy later revealed the missing organs in her own stomach. She torn them out and swallowed them. The only trace of Vanessa were bare, bloody footprints leading from the bus steps to the woods on the side of the road. Two things are certain from that night. They never found that girl. And I believe in my God even more now. Well, guys, I thank you all for listening. I hope these stories, these two stories, frightened you and scared you. I'll see you again very soon. Mr. Midnight will be here soon as well. Do not worry. And always remember, the darkness always follows.